Thank you all for coming. I'm RJ Fernandez. This is Tamia Falia. I am a, a photographer, printer, and publisher of MAPA Books. And the mother of the crying boy that just left the room. <laughs> um, I started MAPA Books um, in 2016. I've been working as a printer and uh, uh, working with photography in London for the last 10 years. And I really wanted to do something, you know, I really wanted to publish Tommy's book. Tommy's was the first book that I I, I thought of, and it took me about three years to, to convince him, possibly more, uh, to to hand me over 30 years' worth of, of, of images from the Cordillera. And, and, and we, uh, as Mapa Books, we would like to carry on producing or more more photography books from the Philippines and hopefully expanding to Southeast Asia. Tommy, Tommy's Ely was our first book, so I'm really, really thrilled that he is here with us today. Hi, um, I'm Tommy Hapalia, and uh, sorry because uh, my friends from the academe, I will be uh, talking a bit of the photograph. Uh, through my experience in taking photos, and, uh, he will allow me to share the little that I know, uh, uh, the little that I know about the Cordillera, and I'll be touching on uh, a bit of the misrepresentation, I mean symbols and icons, uh, the results of what I've learned through my in, uh, involvement into the community. Let's, let this be a very informal thing. Maybe you could ask questions in between, not, not really me talking and, and after I talk and then you ask questions. You could interrupt me. I mean, because I'm not in, the, in authority. I mean, to be, the knowledge that I have about the Cordillera is so limited, maybe the scratch on the surface. And, but if you allow me, I mean, the things that I've learned in the Ili, they call it the Ili, where you belong. The Ili, Ili means where you belong, where you are, uh, where your attachment, your soul is in the Ili. <coughs> like the first image here, uh, originally it's called the Hugo, but it is better known as the Buru. And as you know, it's a pear. And it's one of the most abused, misused icon in the Cordillera, if you agree. I mean, like, since it doesn't represent a god, which is written like it's the rice god. But from my field works and my involvement with the community, I've learned that it is the highest form of hardship. It is part of healing. Uh, they, they perform, again, we'll be jumping from one, uh, like the, the Imbaya festival in Banawe, in Ifugao. The word Imbaya actually is part of healing, it, the term ibayahon, meaning to say the baya is uh, rice beer, rice wine. They will make baya because for a healing ritual. And there, if you are a tomona and you own a lot of, I mean, big piece of land, and you control the rituals. And of course, Ifugao has the most complex uh, ritual cycle from conception to birth to death and beyond. And uh, you, uh, along the way, I mean, you work the land, the field, your rice field, day in, day out. And eventually, you get sick, you get weak from working the land, working the, the rice. 
that that's the time that the, the Tomo now would be uh, calling the assistance of the Baki. And then it's a long process actually. And then they will perform the healing ritual. And then they will assign, as earlier Ikin presented uh, yesterday, about Tagiling. Tagiling is an artisan of Bulul or Fuku. That's why uh, the Bulul and Fuku are named after the artisan who made it. And then they will perform the healing, uh, sacrifice animals, uh, and <laughs> They always come in pair, a man and a woman. It can never stand alone. Representing the family of the Tomona, who's weak, getting weak. So they start the healing, that they do sacrifice. And then after the, the ritual, they, the ritual actually, they, they put, they transfer the negative things in this icon, the sickness, the misfortune that you're having, you encountered into this. So it is just like a bin, a trash bin of negative. After the healing ritual is that <coughs> this icon next to nothing. Actually you could use it for firewood. But since a spirit was put in, all the negative things were put it becomes secondary that it will become a guardian of the agamang or where they, they, they store the rice. So if you are, if you have bad intentions of stealing someone else's harvest, you have this second thing, I mean, you might as well, I mean, <laughs> move away from that because the sickness, the misfortune that was transferred in this icon would Trans, be transferred to you. Mm -hmm. so, and again, misrepresentation. I mean, like, they're using it on letterheads, trophies, and if you know how it's been used in Ifugao, why do they use these icons to represent the Cordillera? Mm -hmm. Since uh, all the things here are so negative. I mean, like, and it, the secondary function of it being a human scarecrow. That's why they put it in the uh, prized possession, which is their harvest, to guard it as a guardian. Mm. Tommy, could you tell us the story of um, when you took these photos and what was seen across from the room? Uh, uh, the first image, it was in the same uh, granary, rice granary. <laughs> Uh, uh, the second one, <laughs> it's just like an arm. <laughs> so, meaning to say, the, the Tomona, I mean, through the years, been sick or um, uh, encountered misfortune along the way while working the land. That's why you have several. Okay, tell me, are they made specifically or they're kept as an heirloom and it's transferred continually? It is transferred continually to the, to the Tomona. Yeah, but they have more than one. Does this mean that? What, at what time do they change them or add? They don't change them. Every time that you they you have you you would be feeling weak, and then you would be asking again the baki to perform. But with, when did you make a new one? Because there's more than two here, right? So yeah. You had an extra, another one made. What would, you know why they would do mm, I don't know why, but uh, according to Balwo, the mm -hmm. the owners of the the hugo, I mean. A lot, through the years of working the land, she's been sick for several I mean, of them. Second mm -hmm. image, you want me mm -hmm. to? <laughs> uh, the, do you want me to read the caption? Oh, okay, please. I know, sorry. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. I thought it would be interesting to <laughs> read the caption in the book because it's 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 such a detailed. An incredibly detailed um, manner of, 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 of creating the hugo or the bulul. The hugo or the bulul is one of the most misrepre misrepresented figures of the Cordillera. It is commonly believed to be a rice god. In Ifugawa, a Tomona, as Tommy was saying, which the Tomona is the owner of vast tracts of rice field, falls ill or is overcome with misfortune, he or she can call on the Mumbakis to perform a healing ritual. 
The Bakis will then visit the Muyo, a communal forest, to choose a hardwood tree, usually a nara, that will then be used to carve the hugo. An artisan is given the task to create a pair of hugos that will represent the tamona. The process of carving is a ritual itself. For the duration of its creation, the artisan is not allowed to bathe nor sleep with his wife. He is not allowed to wash his hands, save for three fingers he uses to eat. Once the hugos are complete, the bakis will conduct a series of invocations to transfer the sickness and misfortunes of the tamona to the wooden icons. The ritual includes an animal sacrifice. When the ritual is finished, the hugos may be discarded. However, however, most tomonas keep them in the rice granaries to ward off thieves. They believe that if someone wants to steal from the granary, they will hesitate when they see a hugo. They'll know that the owners have endured misfortune and that the icons now possess these elements. In essence, the hugos become scarecrows. Now the artisans who made it, who went through those, uh, <coughs> uh, not sleeping with the wife and not taking a bath, they named this icon to them, like a tinagiling bulu, or a kinabigat, meaning to say a kinabigat made by a kabigat, who is an artisan, gamal, who is another artisan. So they are not gods, they are the artisan. It's named after the artisan submitted. Yeah. We actually have a photograph of Kabigat. Kabigat, yeah. Uh, from 1984, doing a, uh, I think he was doing a ritual. Yeah, the ritual is uh, Abogwa, the second burial. So, I mean, that when I was there. Yeah, <laughs> so I think then yeah. the next one we'll be talking about would be uh, yeah, uh, sorry. Here, uh, in the mountain province, this is Sagada. This is in the mount. And you will notice on your right, their left, is a Tinagtago. It's called a Tinagtago. And very similar uh, to the Bulur. But it doesn't, uh, I mean, the, the function of that it's not. Yeah, it's so it can be inside the house. Yeah, it beca the basically it's inside that. Maybe uh, people uh, from Sagada here? They're all out there. They're all out there. They're preparing. They know the talk. Actually, the, the Tinagtago would be your first wedding present from your parents and from the community. But when you get married and you uh, go on a separate house, they call it the Min uh, the first thing that they will give to you uh, in your house is the Tinagtago. It's the, your first wedding present to guard it. So again, it's a guardian, actually. They put it beside the hearth, which is the heart of the house, near that uh, very widely visible, again, with the Lalo here, on his right, you will see a Tinagtago. Very similar. The icon is very similar. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There. <laughs> so if uh, you have bad intentions of entering somebody's house because before, you don't have keys. But when you see, uh, when you live, some, some, oh, someone's there. So. Better not. I mean, better not after that. <laughs> the next image is... Mm, yeah. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> oh, okay. Here we go. Uh, there's no generic... Uh -oh. anybody, anybody familiar here with the wishing, the Ling Ling O, the Lubai, or the Dinumo? There's... The, the <laughs> uh, I, I will talk about that later, after uh, the, 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 here. It's written in the books that it's a fertility ring. But uh, the way I, I went, <laughs> it is more of a nobility symbol. 
that Jean Pearl uh, Brett says the first time it was used is she's traced it back to a, a antique dealer in the 1960s in Marbay mm -hmm. who used it as a way of selling and as everyone knows lowlanders and foreigners want fertility symbols from primitive people Probably. and she said it was about mid 60s the first time she ever heard anyone call it that <laughs> so June has traced the origin of that idea <laughs> the origin of that idea and who would have known the anatomy of a woman two, three hundred years ago. So, yeah. practice. And no uh, <laughs> putting it together like a, the womb of a woman yeah. being. But men and women wear it. In Ifugao, they call it the Ling Ling O. In the mountain province in Sagada, they call it the Wishing. Mm -hmm. In Upper Bontok, they call it the Sing Sing. And going towards the, the eastern part, they call it the Dinumu. And in, in Kalinga, they call it the Lubai. For me, it is more of sharing. And if you notice behind Handaan Udan, Amumbaki, the, no, the nose part of the butchered sacrifice. <laughs> so, uh, meaning to say that if you butcher, you did rituals, you can't consume the whole carabao. You share it with people. So it's more of a sharing rather than a fertility. I mean, in a sense, the word fertility, maybe he has fertile land, fertile livestock that he shared to the community. So it is more when you see someone wearing a lot of the meaning to say, a no, kadangyan, because he shared what he had. The society in which status is conferred by what you give away and not by what you accumulate. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> 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 yeah, and that is. Ah, where is that? Oh, yeah, that's it. That's it. The basket. Yeah. That's it? The basket. Oh. <coughs> oh, here. Uh, this photograph was taken in 1984, and not mistaken in Kirakin. As you could see. There are several. It represents a Kadangyan or Baknang. And if you look at it a little bit further, uh, the kubi, the chicken hoops. This photograph was taken in the late afternoon because they'll keep the chicken a little bit. Why do they keep the chickens hanging? Of course, I mean, like, you know, in Ifugao, that's why you have the the, the Libon, the Libon, yeah, the, the, the protected, the, yeah. Yeah. and to keep them from being attacked, attacked from rats. rats, because rats cannot go east face or north face yeah. Yeah, to climb up, <laughs> to, the mm -hmm. to, protect to protect them from, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. wait, anyway, uh, we'll, any more, I mean, like, Questions as far as I can answer, maybe if you have some questions. <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> uh, the kind of a world that you're projecting is there's much stuff out there that you need to be protective. So the whole uh, society, the sociological implication is there is a lot of bad stuff out there, bad spirits. That's why you need all of these uh, objects so that they don't harm you. To appease them, yeah. yeah. To appease, mm -hmm. to protect. To protect. Yeah, when you start talking about that, the assumption is there's something bad or wrong out there that you have to stop them from harming you. Yeah, the correct? unseen. <laughs> is that correct? Yes, that's the unseen. I mean, like the anitos. So, but the word anito, again, is not very cordillera. Uh, anito is from the lowland. The term anito is not from cordillera. They also use it in Indonesia. How about the bulls that are holding bowls? Do they have a different function? Why are they holding bowls? Uh, it is a design, I mean, more contemporary. Oh. Uh, that's why uh, I had a talk with uh, Constance Montbrisson yes. and 
uh, the, the curator, of, and she was boasting with this uh, item that she acquired for the museum and said uh, it is a more contemporary design. I mean, <laughs> rather than, I mean, it was used in it. I think Anna has a question. Yeah. Yes, Anna. I have a question more about your photographic practice. Um, as I understand it, you are a part of the community, and so you go back there, you have been doing that for over 30 mm -hmm. years, and you go back there not just to take photos, but to bring photos to the people who you photograph. Um, and I'm wondering how this ties into the concept of Ely. Of? Of, of the Ely. Uh -huh. um, maybe you could talk a little bit about why you, you do this, because, I mean, there are not a lot of not a lot of photographers, you know, who do that effort to come back and to bring these photos back. Actually, it's uh, the way I started into photography. I went into the Ely, different Ely's, without any camera hanging on my neck, a fancy necklace coming out, hanging on my neck. But mostly to, in, to establish a rapport with the people, with having this in mind that eventually the practices, the, the rituals in the Cordillera would be thinning away. And I give them, I give them an introduction that I'm documenting this for uh, this practices, this daily life, for the next generation to come. It's for them to know, I mean, maybe I could contribute visually. I mean that this is a very rich culture, and this is part of our being Igorot or being a Kalinga or an Ifugao. Yes. Have you ever been influenced by other photographers? Uh, like. You would say, much better. <laughs> <laughs> Since the resources, when I was starting, into, started quite late in photography, uh, after I took aircraft maintenance engineering in Manila, didn't know anything about the arts. But when I uh, went home, eventually I was invited to Mount Pulag. And since I don't know how to write or paint at that, I thought of photography uh, being a medium to express my. So then uh, I started from landscapes to why not the people? And then there. But I did a different approach of going into communities without nothing and just telling them my purpose. I mean, like my, maybe my contribution later for the coming generation so they may see. part of their very rich culture. And then there again, as the... Yeah. Mm. Well, I think Tommy, because we did the same thing, we always gave, we took photos and gave photos. We used to send them down to Senor Masferi to have them developed and he'd send them back up on the bus. Um, he lived in Boito then. Uh, people, what they remarked immediately to us is most people come here and take the picture. You come here and give the because they were used to people coming to photograph the exotic and take them away. Mm -hmm. So the immediate response to us was, wow, you're different. And I, it's also the appreciation, because you don't know, because behind your back, I know what people say, and they say, he's like that. He's also someone who comes and gives something mm -hmm. and shares it, because most people just want to take the picture and take it away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that reinforces, again, your, your involvement with the community when you go back. Oh, this is what I took of you. And you keep the bond. I mean, like you reinforce it. But again, they they're so sometimes they're so they 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 they, they put up a wall that when you take a photo, you need to say that you you're taking the soul with them, because a lot of photographers did promise to go back and give them photos, but ne they never they never went back. And by the way. I'll be showing a short film, just 11 minutes. Uh, the one I took in 1988, it's called The Dante. Uh, where is it? 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 Where
we take it down? Yeah. <coughs> so is there history? Where's the one? I opened it online. No, it's not there. I'll open it online. Oh, yeah, that's what we did. Yeah. Okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we opened it online, but we lost it. You can bring it. <laughs> yeah, sorry, apologies. <laughs> we I had it ready and then... Uh, well, anyway, while uh, she's fixing the thing, the Dante is done. I mean, like, in, it's in Sagada. They do it every after mm -hmm. 10 years. And they reestablish the mm, boundaries of Sagada. And actually, and aside from that, it is a call from the people who left Sagada, who went to what they call Balasil Tao, across the sea, mm -hmm. to come back and pay a visit. It always worked. I mean, like the, the, the two uh, Dante that I was part of, every time, I, because the Dante is a, a total of a 90 day Sorry, I ritual. And after the ritual, people from the U.S., from the U.K. would start coming home to pay a visit in Sagat. So I haven't used a Windows computer. And <laughs> Sorry, I wasn't prepared to not have it here. Is it enough? Is this one? Can I? Yes, it is. It is it's did you ever get to um meet the late Did you ever get to Yeah. Uh, later in the nineteen eighty four uh, Mr. Eduardo Masfer was supposed to do an exhibit at the Smithsonian. But it didn't push through. But before that uh, I was working with this cinematographer friend Boy Nigan. Uh, uh, doing a film on the Ifugao, and we delivered from this from the Goethe Institute from the Germany. We delivered photo paper for Mr. Masfer in 1984, and that's the first time that I met her. Okay. Are we on? Yeah. Are we on? Yeah. No. On, on these ones, not on the, maybe on the front one, but you're on on the. <coughs> Sagada for other opportunities in the big world outside. But home always beckons. Once in every decade, the elders of Sagada community would announce through a ritual the call to come home. <laughs> One early morning in April 1988, the community's chief turned over to his wife the Vlaya, or a necklace made of crocodile and one boar's teeth. She was going to be officer for that day only, after the I, the community center of decision making. Led by the community's group of elders, the men were going to do the Dante, the ritual issuing the call to vote. At the same time, they were going to visit and renew the boundaries of Sagada. 
There was going to be no work to be done during the day. On this day, the men should be clad in wings or g-strings and no footwear. Especially for the ritual, the animals also wear a headgear of rooster feathers. The men also take turns in carrying a native pig, essential to the ritual. Inside their bamboo and rattan backpacks is cooked rice. In a bamboo pitcher is sabun, a fermented drink. They go on a lewis, or a fast-paced trek in rhythmic cadence with a beating of their shields. On reaching a basin, the group's first stop, the elder cuts a portion of the pig's ear. He puts it on a stake and issues a call or boom. The rest of the men moved to the next station.
Muhammad the Assassin, the chief, has gone ahead to the Mulutan, the final station. The other men, now weary from blazing the trails, meet the chief for the final ritual. The chief inspects the sacrificial pig sliver. The internal parts of the pig, specifically the liver and the bile, are basis for the chief forecast which he proclaimed. Using a language often only understood by the elder, Alapat Gazan says the Susua, a form of prayer. The warriors now form a wall made of their spears and shields, enclosing the area of the ceremony. It is now late in the afternoon. Then the men go back to the Dapa. The call to come home or the dump ferry has already been done. reverberates through the majestic cordilleras inviting those who consider their home for that.